My name's John Schumann. I'm um, best known perhaps as a singer-songwriter. I put um, post-traumatic stress disorder back into the national conversation with a song I wrote called I Was Only 19, which is sort of why I'm here. Um, and I'm with uh, Dr Nick Ford, a clinical psychiatrist. Yeah, my name's Nick Ford. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Adelaide in psychiatry. And probably for the past 20 years, most of my work has involved police, military and first responders pretty much looking out for the guys who look after us and protect us. Without favour we or effect. made the observation early in the piece that this movie Dark Blue is the stories of real cops, real stories from real cops. I'm, and I know this to be true because um, part of my role very early on in the piece was to interview about 20 to 25 policemen and women from all around Australia and uh, I came back from one set of interviews quite traumatised um, because of the stories that I was told um, so much so that I had a head full of barbed wire and I had to go and see a mate of mine who's a psychologist and get some help dealing with this and it occurred to me that if I feel this bad just having heard these stories how bad would I feel if I actually lived them like these courageous and generous police men and women who did share their stories with me? We all have dreams. One of the gigs that happens is that this is difficult and dangerous work. Someone has to do this work, someone has to do these jobs. These are jobs that carry risks, but a lot of things in life carry risks. And what we're wanting to talk about particularly is how to manage those risks, the type of things that help to minimise the psychological risks over time and the types of remedies that can be pulled in if things do happen to go patient. This film uh, has got a couple of objectives. It's to eradicate stigma. It's to educate and make people aware. And it's to encourage people once they are aware and they are educated about the signs and symptoms to get help early because we all know that if you get help early you can recover, you can recover fully and get back to work. One of the things that really surprises me is that stigma still exists. These conditions have been talked about for two and a half, three thousand years. So Hippocrates her. and Galen, the physicians of four or five hundred BC, were forever talking on about the impact of major life events and causing psychiatric problems. And we, we still have a fuss about it these days. These are operational variables. These factors of morale are something that are going to beset any people who are put into the line of danger. And learning how to manage that risk is absolutely vital. And one of the things with these guys is they never quite know what they're going to happen. Anything could happen as they're just driving along as we're about to see. Yeah, so uh, here's the, um, the first episode you I just wonder what's going on in the in the hearts and the heads of these two coppers you know, obviously they're drawn to being police officers because they want to serve but but this cannot be easy I mean, it cannot be easy to be doing it in front of a kid who is seriously traumatized. Um, I guess the police that I talk to in those sort of moments, like the soldiers, like doctors, like nurses, is you're in a bit of a zone. You're, you're thinking that you're, you're not thinking that you're ten feet put, tall and bulletproof. You're just acting as if you are. You're acting according to the process. You're suppressing any emotions. Right now, the policeman is doing CPR. That's a process that looks pretty rough. There's a story that if you're not breaking ribs, you're not doing it right. The least of his concerns is that child. Now, it may not look terribly pleasant, but the reality is that the woman's life has to be saved. Now, there's going to be a dump, an adrenaline dump later on. What do you mean by an adrenaline dump? When you're revved up that high, then there will be a period where your body just wants to shut down and go into rest. You're running with your sympathetic nervous system on high, high charge for a period of time. Um, usually it's a lot shorter than you think it is. So you're running adrenaline through your body, you're pumping a lot of cortisol through your body, and you will experience 
when the, the, the stress is removed, you'll experience that as a flatness and a depression and a fatigue. The longer that high alert, that high arousal goes on, then a whole bunch of other changes start happening in the mind and the body that can go into all sorts of places that we'll talk about as time goes on. We use phrases like um, a, a adrenaline dump to describe what happens to us when we're being in a high arousal situation and we know what they are. Mm. Uh, interestingly, just listening to that, I, I think about sometimes um, c coming off stage after a, you know, a really, really successful performance in front of a lot of people um, and I'm buzzing, you know, but I also know and, and that buzz will last for quite some time and I'll sometimes try to drink it down um, but I do know that you know often the next day or a bit lat later on that evening I'll feel unbelievably flat and unbelievably tired and socially disengaged. I, I think that's what we're talking about and there's, there's a couple of things in that the tendency to try and slow that down in all sorts of ways with alcohol is one of those problems and that can lead into problem errors. You also see people who, you know, being in that zone feels quite good and people try and preserve it by continuing risk-taking behaviours. We're going to get to that in a moment because this is kind of the reverse um, of that situation where the guy's just done something really cool to save that woman's life and he's getting thanked for it. We don't often see the police getting thanked as much as we should. We don't often see the soldiers and nurses and doctors, etc., getting thanked as much as they should. But it's funny, when I mention to people that I'm working with police, the immediate reaction is, gee, those guys do a tough job. Um, and the gratitude is, is quite enormous. What's he feeling now? I think he's feeling a little bit overwhelmed. He's thinking, like, this is a really good job and I can see why I do it. It's, it's lovely. It's a really lovely thing that they did. And it probably doesn't happen nearly enough. No, it doesn't. But the, the alternative, just getting back to this idea of this crash after a high oh, arousal this, situation. Look at this. Look at this. Yep. That guy's a dead set prick. Get off the floor, constable. And not helpful, Sergeant. I wouldn't have thought. Um, there are chains of command that are helpful and encourage guys to um, stay well and there are chains of commands that uh, are unhelpful. So bad after all. One of the problems in these high arousal situations, just getting back to that, is that in that flat period you start to second guess, you start to think of how I could have, should have done better. And that's where one of the problems um, can fall in because people start second guessing and ruminating over about how they should have done, done things differently. Particularly if it doesn't end up well as it did in this particular episode. There's a great line from World War I, um, courage is what a man does. What goes through his mind is his own affair. And everybody's scared in these situations. Everybody feels that they're useless. Now look at this bit here. This is where the commanding officer tells him that he's got to go and pull the body out of the car. This is the first major, major trauma, I suppose, in, in this narrative. Do you, do you think she should have been a bit more sympathetic? With respect, probably not. Um, there is a certain amount of confronting the reality of the work that you need to do. Um, and, you know, I recall aspects of my own medical training about that. But I guess there's also, Grant may have benefited from some awareness of what the job is going to entail. And yeah, it's going to involve blood and guts. But I don't think anybody really goes into a job expecting they're going to have to pull a dead kid out of a car, really. Because if you did, if you really, you know, sort of confronted the reality of that ahead of receiving the warrant card. You know, I don't know about you, but I would probably think pretty carefully about whether this was the career for me. I guess one of the things that I see with 
the, the groups of people who do this kind of work is they are pretty lion-hearted and they are pretty committed to making a difference. Perhaps I'm, you know, blowing them up too much. This is difficult, dangerous, horrific work. Someone has to undertake this job. That, um, that child that died um, was somebody's son. The man who died in that car accident was somebody's husband, brother. Someone has to do this work. It's the awareness of the risks that come with it and the management within the teams that's a really critical thing. I'm interested in, in the Are You OK email here that, that they that the department sends out. I mean, in the narrative, the dark blue narrative, it's, it is not effective and he, he resists it. But he also resists... Right. A cup of coffee from his mate. She, she's she's reaching out. Look, a- absolutely, and th- these are really awkward things for um, uh, you know some of these groups. The the individuals who fess up to having a mental health problem, they become aware that there is a stigma. They become aware that this could affect their career. The reality is, sometimes it doesn't. It does affect careers. And that there is that stigma still floating around out there. And we'll talk about that more later. Your fellows, your colleagues are going to reach out to you with a cup of coffee or a conversation. Yeah, but he he resisted. He 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 sort of like pushed back against what I saw in the narrative as a very genuine and caring approach from a mate, from a colleague. Do you want to talk about this? And I think what the his 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 partner did then was absolutely fantastic and that's what should be done and if somebody's reaching out to you after a tough job with a cup of coffee as a police officer just take it up and maybe that um maybe his partner needs to ask him three or four times but we can see where this is going now his heads are starting to fill with with thoughts of shame maybe he should be doing better maybe he shouldn't be feeling like this maybe he should manage himself now these are the myths that he's telling himself and he's starting to use alcohol to help him bolster those myths because he doesn't want to rely on people because he's starting to feel worthless and maybe he's the sort of person who doesn't deserve helping depression's a really interesting illness it kind of digs its own hole people start to feel worthless so they behave, they cut themselves off from people. They start to feel so there's no future, so they don't do anything, and the situation gets worse and worse. So we've got nightmares here. I mean, almost anybody who knows anything about post-traumatic stress disorder will, you know, cite nightmares and, and flashbacks. Is that real? Absolutely. Or is, it, or, or is that just popular culture? No, ab- ab- absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, there are a whole bunch of symptoms with, with go with PTSD, but it really starts with the nightmares and the dissociative flashbacks. Essentially what you've got is a whole bunch of reality that the brain isn't able to absorb or it's had too much of that time and time again. So the normal bits of our brain that help us to be reasonable, equable, analytical people, kind of like yourself, John, um, <laughs> stop, stop working. And instead, the fight or flight centres, a little bit of brain tissue called the amygdala takes over and that starts to flood the brain with emotional memories that the brain simply isn't able to put together as a story. So there are nightmares and there are dissociative flashbacks. These aren't just... What, what's a dissociative flashback? Yeah, that is where you lose contact with reality so that you are, for even a microsecond, stuck in the moment so it's like it's all happening again and you get all the sensations that go with that vision sound is a big one smell smell absolutely um senses of movement sometimes pain um you know at their very worst you might get a a reaction where you dissociate for 30 minutes or so but these things just have a habit of popping apparently randomly into your brain and, and because they're uncomfortable, because people then start the avoiding things. Oh, and they get irritable and cranky too. Now this bit here, I mean, we know that he wants to move the child seat into the centre because of the experience of pulling the kid out of the car. But he's just yelling at his wife here. He's, there, there, there's, no, there's, there's no sort of calm rationality. Is that... 
Is that part of the cause? Absolutely. You know, look, one of the, the other symptoms that comes up a lot is the sense of concern for loved ones, concern that whatever you see out there that is bad or evil, that it's going to happen to people that you're connected. One, one of the things that really bothers the guys as the nightmares progress with PTSD is very often loved ones start falling into those nightmares and it's pretty scary the first time it happens. So I usually warn people that it might happen at some point. But overprotection, starting to become monomaniacal and picking a fight with your wife because the, the only thing that's important is getting that baby seat right. The fact that you're going to hurt her back becomes irrelevant. And when you in that space, your judgment starts to go, your ability to be balanced and rational starts to get affected and we're about to see that now. Yeah, this is really interesting. I, I, I'm interested in understanding why he would mistake a, a jacket on a car seat for a, for a kid. What's going on here? Yeah. When this bit of your brain that is misbehaving, the, the amygdala, the fight, which is the size of a walnut, so I'm going to refer to it as the walnut from now on, and there's a few other bits connected with that circuit. When it's operating, it starts to look for associations. It starts to look for things like the thing that caused the trauma and it's a great one for misidentifying it's great on emotion it's great on getting us ready for danger it's lousy on detail if you are attacked by a bengal tiger it won't be long before you're scared of chairs because chairs have four legs too that's the way that bit of the brain operates with logic so he is going to see this thing in the back of the seat he's going to misidentify it he's also got darkness and flashing lights against him and a highly intense arousal situation with a couple of people who i'm sure are lovely but right now they're intoxicated and obnoxious no she had the camera i can't imagine what it would be like to be doing this kind of work knowing that um, somebody's got their camera out and there's going to be a video up on Facebook. I mean, that of itself, forget anything else that goes on, that of itself must must precipitate, you know, great anxiety and apprehension. You've got a massive level of arousal going on there um, and it would be easy to let it flood and act and get into fisticuffs. But you also have to, as part of your job, control that and restrain it. Um, it really like, is like having a, uh, a very cranky elephant alive inside your chest. And you have the videos. You have the cameras that are watching you and scrutinising you. It's a really awkward situation. I taught high school for, for a couple of years and uh, every now and again I'd have to go down and break up a fight. Interestingly, uh, I'd go down to, 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 to break up the kids. The moment I put my hand on these kids who were at each other's throats, suddenly I was in this fight. I was a third fighter when, in fact, when I approached the scene, I was quite calm and rational. I don't know what that's all about, but I found that any number of occasions. Yeah, you're certainly getting triggered. I'm, I'm really interested in the portrayal of command in this situation. I mean, you know, the reality is that command doesn't always look after people properly it's it's brutal it's focused on uh, focused on discipline and discipline only but there are also commanders that i've met that i've been involved with that i've worked with their guys who are awesome in how they look after their guys they treat their guys as an asset and they help them recover um okay so we've got a packet of what i'm assuming uh, antidepressants yeah, it looks like I didn't see the label, but uh, I think that's where we're up to in that part of the story. So, so antidepressants. I mean, I, I, I've always sort of thought that, you know, if you're suffering from depression and anxiety, you, you know, you pop along to the doctor, which is what they tell you to do. Mm. Go and talk to your GP. You get a prescription for antidepressants. Jobs, job done, problem solved, or not. Um, no, and you know, there's still this argument that happens, you know, should it be antidepressants or should it be psychotherapy or should it be both? I mean, the reality is the fact that it should be both was sorted out, the earliest I can see is 1978, but we still keep arguing with the toss. Antidepressants are a brace around an injured brain. 
um, and like any brace, if you sprain or break break a bone, yeah, you need to bolt it together or plaster it, but you need to do exercise. You need to reconfigure how that limb moves in the same way we use the medications to stabilise and the brain then needs to reconfigure to adjust to the situation, the circumstances that it's found in. Taking an antidepressant um, without a talking therapy is not really going to work that well. And by the way, in my job, you know, I'm usually using two or three different antidepressants, but then I'm dealing it with a very difficult um, uh, group of patients or spectrum. Nick, conversational therapy, is that what restructures the brain? Yeah, the, um, the talking therapies, the psychotherapies, and there are all sorts of different types, but the reality is most people mix them up. That's what restructures the brain. It's about seeing reality as it really was. Remember we talked about the second guessing that the guys do? Coulda, shoulda done better? Who said that? I figured it was time to catch up. Yeah, man. So Uncle John's popped in to see him because he's he's had the word from Karen. How, how important are these conversations? These conversations are really important. <clears throat> One of the things I'm interested in there is with um, Uncle John, who's technically a blood relative, but there's lots of Uncle Johns floating around, and Auntie Janes as well. Um, wise older police, wise older soldiers who understand how the job works and sometimes they've been through these conditions themselves, they know how it works. They're really valuable and they should be listened to. Um, conversations with your peers are absolutely vital. One of the things that we're seeing a lot in psychiatrists are a real lot of support for peer counselling as a mode for preventing some of these disorders and flagging when the next level up, which thus needs to be um, referred to. Yeah, some um, some army psychs have told me that um, when there is you know an event an IED or a contact or you know somebody's been hurt, often the psychs will just put the team who was involved in the IED episode or the contact or whatever it was in a space on their own and just let them have a talk themselves without any interference at all. And they they say that that can be quite effective. The police don't do that anymore. The 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 wet debrief is the thing of the past. The whole gig about um, critical incident stress debriefing, having a psychologist or a psychiatrist come in and talk to the team, the reality is it doesn't work. The way this model actually started in World War Two actually involved the guys getting together um, and giving an account of the battle, and that actually was proved to be proved to be therapeutic. The wet debrief, alcohol, not such a good idea. But what have we replaced it with? That becomes an issue. Nothing. We replaced it with nothing. Yeah, and again, it varies from station to station. It varies from commander to commander. You see some teams where you know the guys are looking out for each other. You know the sergeants are looking out. I've seen superintendents do a round trip of 600 kilometres in a day to come and be a part of a case conference about one of the guys. In those particular cases, I'm thinking the guys were back at work in record time and went and stayed. Um, Grant got four weeks off. Stress leave, mental health leave. How Im- how effective is time off? Time off can be vital. Time off with a purpose. There's a period of rest um, that needs to happen because the brain has actually taken a serious wound, but then it needs to be structured and you gradually restructure duties, gradually in that time off, restructure the use of time and there also needs to be therapy some sort of treatment involved and therapy isn't just doing relaxation therapy twice a week with a psychologist nor is it just taking an antidepressant there needs to be a focus there needs to be a purpose and it needs to be associated with liaison with the workplace see these two guys here you you know that there is no sympathy there is no empathy there's no understanding at all i mean this this police station, under this particular senior sergeant, who, as I've memorably observed, is a dead set brick, seems to have a very toxic culture. Look, it, it does seem to have a toxic culture, um, and you know, support for injured police officers, being kind, setting appropriate duties is reasonable. The reality, however, is that if you're a copper and you're going in a battle, 
with a copper who's just had some time off with post-traumatic stress disorder, you're going to be worried about whether you can trust that guy, whether you can work with that guy. So the copper returning to work will need to gradually reconsolidate himself and also be proving his strength back to the team. No one goes back to the A grade straight after a, a, a fractured knee. You start slowly and you build your way up. I can't imagine what that would be like. I cannot imagine it. I would be totally trashed if I had to do that. One of the things the guys talk about um, with the flashbacks that we were talking about earlier, screaming, the sound of screaming seems to be particularly common and particularly distressing. Holding someone who's distressed, watching their distress, wanting to stop it, is a natural human reaction, but it can't always be done. Sometimes you just got to contain it. Now here's the bit where he gets the are you okay message. I've talked to lots of cops who, you know, understand that it's a departmental initiative, but they don't see that it's very effective or very helpful at all. The interaction with a police psychologist um, can be extremely important, extremely helpful. Actually, having it happen there so that the the interaction isn't between the psychologist and the police officer grant it's between the whole station everybody's watching now that's just not going to work it's not going to give that psychologist any useful data the police psychologist carry an awkward line between looking after the organization looking after the officer um, I've had some really good experiences of working with police psychologists, taking referrals from them, liaising with them about getting back to work, but I'm conscious that's not always the way it is. And you've got to get the right one, don't you? Um, it's not one size fits Look, it's not one size fits all for any of the mental health professionals. Um, you've got to have somebody that you can relate to and somebody who understands your job. I, t I tell the med students that Rapport is a mixture of respect, trust and compassion and interest, that we're actually interested in what the guys do and we want to find out more about it, as opposed to stereotyping. Here he is uh, on the sofa. That can't be doing the marital relationship all that much good. Well, we've seen the end of the movie and we know the marital relationship's in trouble, but he may be sleeping on the sofa because his wife can't sleep because he's kicking and screaming and keeping her awake because of the nightmares. And he should... Probably and wants him to see a doctor, but he won't. And he's on the turf. And once the alcohol starts, it becomes a very difficult problem to unravel because alcohol is a physically addictive drug and it also messes very much with your judgment, as police see on a regular basis every day they go to work, I imagine. Yeah, my understanding is that, you know, alcohol abuse is often uh, associated with a mental health condition, but you don't know which one comes first. Does the mental health condition come first, followed by the alcohol abuse, or is the mental health condition precipitated by alcohol abuse? Probably on balance, the mental health condition precedes the alcohol abuse. There are a certain number of people who are just steered toward it. But here we see Grant taking risks. He's not really looking after himself. He's not making sensible decisions. He's put himself into what looks like a fighting pub, if I may say such a thing. He's standing, he's arguing with that guy instead of disengaging and walking away. He's also way too close. A kick and a half, I think, is the distance with somebody who's in that frame of mind. He's being reckless. He has diminished regard for himself. And that's part of the evolving depression. People couldn't give couldn't give a rats about themselves. They take risks. So what is it about the risk that gives them some sort of comfort? Partly it keeps alive the adrenaline, the sense of being in the zone, and sometimes it's a, a lack of self-care. It's a lack of... It's, it's, it's a wanting to die. It's wanting the worst thing to happen. Where's your gun, mate? Where's your gun? You'll fucking see it in a minute, cunt. Here's my fucking gun. I'll fucking bend you over the fucking table, cunt. I'll fucking have you. Are you just touched me? You fucking see that? Fucking not touch me. Fucking touch me. There the camera again. 
Now, notwithstanding my um, antipathy towards the senior sergeant, um, well documented in his conversation, I might say, mm-hmm. I have a bit of sympathy for him now. I mean, it must be pretty tough. It must be a pretty tough job. I think being in command of these guys is really a tough job because, among other things, to be in command of these guys, you've had the experiences they've had over time and some of them you'll encapsulate, some of them will still linger with you and you also have a lot of an administrative burden. Some guys handle it well with leadership, some guys less well. Combined with untreated traumatic experiences will compound in the mind like one drip at a time filling a glass, leaving less and less room for rational thought. If untreated, eventually the glass will be full. For a while, things were getting better. But then he started spiralling down again. The ways of coping get more and more limited. Um, Exercise is a great way of coping. But this guy's starting to be a bit of a one-trick pony. And it's kind of cool to be a police officer and be able to advise your neighbourhood and your community about safety. Very handy people to have around. That message could have been better delivered. Being impatient, making mistakes, tripping over stuff, the consequences that come from that, the reinforcement that you're a bad person, all these things are starting to spiral. And hearing your wife screaming at you when she's probably, at that point, expressing concern. These are the distortions that happen when the walnut state taking control of your brain. See, here's another one of these episodes. I can't begin to imagine what it would be like to front up, you know, to a task like this. I just can't imagine it. I'm just not tough enough. I guess the problem is that incidents like this happen. Horrific things do happen. The world isn't a fair place. It certainly isn't always a good place. And we're about to see... And a really horrific thing, one of the things that I think gets under everybody's skin is stuff to do with children. But to make a difference, you've really got to maintain that control in the situation, in the zone. But he appears to be in the zone here. He appears to be under control. He's... He's... So far, so good, but we know he's been struggling over time. And he's doing really well. He's got the guy on the ground. He's handcuffing him, taking control of the situation, even using at that point a fairly gentle voice. And gentle for the circumstances, anyway. Trying to quiet and him down. And this is the point at which he finds out what actually happened. Fucking dirty cunt. Shut the oh, fuck up, Ryan. Fucking dirty bastard. It's a sexual assault. Split that baby in two. Yeah, you fucking up. Yeah, I fucked her. I fucked her hard. I fucked her hard and all. Come on, and you fucking hard. You fucking dirty. Now that glass just got too full, too quickly. That was just one thing. Too much. And here we have an argument, much as we've berated the senior sergeant and been critical of how he's managed his guys, one of the things he's correctly pointed out a little while ago is that maybe Grant is becoming a risk and maybe Grant could have been taken off work along with a whole bunch of other things to enable him to quieten down before those judgment lapses became more serious. But Grant doesn't want to be non-operational. I guess the thing is, a lot of people um, want to keep doing what they're doing, um, but they're carrying an injury, and an injury 
very often needs rest and treatment before the individual can be functional again. If you sprain your knee or do your cruise ship playing football, when you head back, you're going to be re-injure yourself. If you have a car, you don't expect it to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and not service it and not look after it. There are some things you need to do to maintain your body. We expect that. There are also things that you do to maintain your brain, and one of them is being aware when your control is starting to slip. But, in fairness to Grant, there were a whole bunch of points where that senior sergeant could have intervened earlier to stop the what, what we're about to see developing with some sympathy and understanding sympathy understanding but also a bit of well i prefer compassion to sympathy i think sympathy kind of weakens a person compassion but also some some pragmatism this is a guy who may have disciplinary problems probably driven by a psychological issue handling the disciplinary problems alone is not going to cut it you need to work out what's actually driving it under the surface getting an appropriate assessment by a psychologist within the department, very likely heading to a psychologist or psychiatrist outside the department. It's going to make life a lot better and enable this guy to be retained. Is it reasonable of Karen to leave at this point? I mean, it seems to me that she's tried. You know, she's... Uh, she's, she's well, yeah, I'm not... I'm not sure reasonable is the word. I mean, it's, it's anticipated, it's expected. Um, you know, there's how much can people bear and also she's got their children to, to care for, to look after. Um, again, we're falling back on the idea that what could have Grant have done to help himself? Who could he have chosen to have gone and see? Who could he have chosen to have a coffee with? <laughs> Could he have asked for a different senior sergeant and a different posting? And there's, and there's the booze again. And now he's laying out for himself the most important things that pertain, in his mind anyway, to his identity. Early warning signs of someone contemplating suicide are many and varied. A sudden uplift in mood, settling of affairs, giving away prized possessions, sentimental messages. Nick, there are more signs than that. Yeah, look, they can be really hard to pick and um, although people will talk about suicide, before they make an attempt, they usually don't talk about it much. You have to be very watchful. Social withdrawal, unwillingness to communicate, preoccupation with death and dark themes are just a few. As the narrator said, sometimes the mood can just suddenly pick up for no good reason. And that's people don't usually get better that quickly. It's very rare. So watch out for people giving away prized possessions, organising their affairs, making unusual and sentimental phone calls, trying to resolve a quarrel five years ago, that kind of thing. Um, I was told once that um, people who are contemplating suicide actually don't want to stop living, they just want the pain to stop. Yeah, and that's really true. Um, the sense of despair, the agony that goes with a severe depressive illness is intense. But the problem is that suicide is the ultimate form of rejection and it's devastating for the families, it's devastating for the friends. And one of the things that you see in patients who've made a suicide attempt is how bruised and battered their relationships are and how difficult it is to reconstitute them afterwards because the partner is, is feeling rejected. The ultimate rejection is, is dying by your own hand. I, have you seen Grant tonight? Anyone? Anyone? He's lucky that he has somebody who is smart enough to work out that something's going on and he's actually doing something about it. He's lucky somebody knows what's going on and somebody's got the skill set and somebody's been observing and helping him. And you, you do see that with good coppers, that they're looking out for each other. 
you particularly see it in the older guys who carry a lot of corporate knowledge, um, whether they're in command or whether they're not in command, they're not watching out for each other. They're a valuable resource. Now, in real life, of course, that motorbike would probably be held up by a guy on a bike riding along without any lights. <laughs> I thought I was strong enough to help everyone, but... Turns out that I'm not. Interestingly, um... more than to be burdened with me. That Beyond Blue report... Sorry, I couldn't be more. ...observes that... Police officers are three times more likely to have a suicide plan, but the rate of suicide in the police force is actually below that in the general population. It's a bit weird. I think there's um, there's suicidal ideation that the Beyond Blue report highlighted. One of the things that we do see with police, like soldiers, is that they are selected for physical and mental fitness. So they're they're an elite. They're a selected population. I, they'll probably laugh when I say that they're elite, but they have been handpicked. And it's remarkable that their suicide rate is actually low. We see morbidity in all sorts of other ways. And here we're about to see that just in the nick of time. Um, Tragedies being being averted. And from here, Grant is going to enter a funnel of care. He's going to be taken to hospital. The ED guys will assess him, resuscitate him if need be, get rid of whatever it is that he's decided to, to try and harm himself with. This is not the end. Probably a couple of days after that, it's just he'll beginning. be seeing one of my one of my colleagues, a liaison psychiatrist. And while not all there's very likely to be a period of hospitalisation involved, and he'll meet other psychiatrists. He'll meet us other psychologists. Treatment will be started. This is likely with a depression of that severity, almost certainly to require medication treatment. Almost certainly. The wife will be asked to comment to give us some history. It may be that that will morph into some sort of marital therapy and there may be a reconciliation. It's very likely that there'll be liaison with the department. It'll be done confidentially. It'll probably go through, in this case, injury management. And then there may be liaison with command. One of the problems that's gonna come up, almost certainly for the story the way it's been told, is that somebody's going to come in and say, look, this suicide attempt was purely because it was a disciplinary issue. This was purely a guy who was a bad lot and he made this attempt. Whereas, as we've seen, the disciplinary issues took quite a while to build up and they were occurring in the context of mental health problems. There are disciplinary issues that are straightforward, but a large proportion of them are related to somebody who's having psychological issues dealing with a job Deal with the discipline by all means, but deal with the psychological issues. Remember, police are valuable resources. They cost a lot of money to train, and the teamwork and the cohesion is really important. Meeting one of our colleagues, it's not going to be therapy forever. I tell my patients my aim is to make them self, myself redundant in their lives as rapidly as I can, to exit as soon as I can, but not so fast that I won't do, do a good job. And we see this day in, month in, month out. Uh, police and soldiers who manage to make a recovery and, and move on back to work. Uh, we see them move on uh, sometimes into, into different careers, but we do see recovery. What I learned um, when I got slapped behind the back of the knees with a acute stress disorder, I mean, I went and got help really, really early, but I learned that, you know, sometimes you, you don't get over things, but you can learn to get past them. Yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. I mean, you'll never forget what you've seen. What you've seen will change you. But you can get through it, and you can actually grow from those experiences. Um, and there's hard data about that, that having recovered from PTSD, it's almost like an immunisation. These are hard jobs that these guys have to do. They see terrible things, somebody has to do that sort of work. I think it's our obligation as a community 
to look after them when they fall over, if they fall over. 